spoke of Clara Barton, who was on uh, caring, a nurse caring for the uh, Union so, uh, soldiers, uh, but as described by a Confederate nurse uh, caring for the Southern uh, soldiers, I quote, I found the barn filled with wounded men and not one thing provided for them. They were lying about the floor on a little straw. Some had been there for two or three days and had not seen a surgeon. I washed and dressed the wounds of about 50 and poured water over the bandages of many more. The value of female nurses were recognized on both sides early in the Civil War and saw them used on a relatively large scale for the first time. Most were volunteers coming from diverse backgrounds, few with any experience, and some more bothersome than helpful. But those who did rise to the occasion, intelligent and capable, quickly made their presence felt. They provided tender care, cleaned up the wards, improved preparation of food, and did much to improve the morale of the wounded. The Union enlisted over 3,000 nurses, not including volunteers of those in General Hospital. Southern women were reluctant to serve as Army nervous nurses as ladies did not venture into a man's world. But as more battles were being fought in the South, sons, husbands, and fathers in need, a considerable number of their own initiated journeys to the front and served where needed. As injured men from battles close by to communities were brought into these towns, local people provided food, clothing, shelter, nursing, and medical care. One of the most important le lessons of the Civil War was the need for cleanliness and sanitation in hospitals and camp. It wasn't there before, and it just had to come about because more people died from illness than they died from battle injuries. The Surgeon General of the Confederacy, uh, Dr. Moore, I alluded to in the previous, previous session, uh, he was indeed a very capable medical leader and a brilliant administrator. Of course, he and his physicians were confronted, confronted by ever dwindling supply of, of what they needed. Uh, he also saw about the, uh, having the distribution of medical books, journals, manuals, and textbooks to uh, help the physicians who cared for these soldiers and worked in the hospitals. Uh, again, he also developed pharmacy methods uh, some of which excelled what they were doing in the North. He also proposed that you build one-story hospitals and to build them of wood, whereas in other areas they were using uh, brick and more permanent structures. But he felt that if these hospitals became infected, uh, and of course they didn't understand the germ theory, but if all the soldiers were getting sick and infection, they could burn the building down and rebuild it, sort of start over. So that was revolutionary at the time. Uh, there were societies formed during the South to help care for the wounded, and he supported this. Of course, he had great difficulty in maintaining medical staff as the war went on. All the medical schools closed in the South, so they were not producing any new physicians. What was unique of the Confederacy, uh, they recognized dentistry separately and I'll speak to that in a minute. And the Confederacy had about 3,500 medical offices, some of which were from Louisiana, of course. Some had been trained in New Orleans. Uh, both medical schools closed after the Union forces took over the, the city and the river. Most military units took physicians with them, and uh, uh, physicians and surgeons. And then hospitals were established to care for the sick and most of this was done along the railroad routes and or came about at the site of battles. But none of them were very good. Overall, for the South and for Louisiana, Dr. Moore, who uh, I spoke to, certainly env envisioned the hospital of the future. John Chrism pioneered in anesthesia and military sur sur uh, surgery. Joseph Jones became the writer of Civil War medicine history in the South, and he was a Louisiana physician. Uh, just to put some faces with some of these, uh, uh, came across these particular uh, 
two physicians, the one that, this one and the one that follows. Um, but uh, they were both from Livingston Parish. And uh, this one, you can see, was born in New York, but came south and was living in Clinton, enlisted in Tangibahoa, and then uh, uh, served uh, uh, here in Louisiana, and ended up being, at the time of his death, buried in the Confederate Cemetery in Clinton. Dr. A.P. Brown, also known as A. Porter, so I guess he had used two different names, but he was the first Louisiana Cavalry. Uh, he was a physician in 1860 uh, at Fort Hudson, and of course this is where one of the great battles of the Civil War uh, was fought. Both armies recognized the need for uh, someone to deal with the medicines, and pharmacists became very important to both the North and the South. I think it's interesting that drug companies that we're very familiar with now, or have been recently, uh, Squibb, Wyatt, McKesson, Robin, Pfizer were all there and were selling medications to the, the, the Union Army. And, and they were making so much money, and of course they were totally dependent on these companies to furnish the drugs that they needed to care for the soldiers, that Dr. Hamild, uh, Hammond, who was the uh, Surgeon General for the Union Army, once they got themselves together after the start of the war, he, d he decided that he would actually have the government go into the drug producing business. And just as he was putting all that together, uh, just to show that uh, how much money that was being made, that just by talking about getting a government owned drug company started, uh, quinine dropped in price by 70 cents even before the lab opened. The South, of course, did not have these drug companies. They had some that were producing medicine, and there was actually one in, in Louisiana that was uh, trying to help out the South. But the South had to use indigenous substitutes, and that was the hallmark of Confederate medicine. They combed the forest and meadows to furnish the Materia Medica, Women's Aid Society planted medicinal gardens. The favorite tonic, appropriately dubbed Old Indigenous, and this was to be like quinine. So they figured if they could produce something that tasted like quinine, which was really bitter and terrible tasting, that it might do well for treating malaria like uh, the real stuff would. And they called it Old Indigenous, and it contained dogwood bark, popular bark, poplar bark, willow bark, and whiskey. It was terribly bitter, just like quinine. Military dentistry, uh, this was a big thing in the Confederacy, not so much in the North, but the South made the profession of dentistry a separate military entity and encouraged its growth. Jefferson Davis, before uh, the Civil War, when he served as Secretary of War under President Buchanan, uh, had wanted a dental corps and was pushing it when he was Secretary of War. It just never did happen because the Union was so behind uh, in their, uh, their medical uh, caring for the uh, military at the time. And a Dr. James B. of Atlanta invented an interdigital splint to correct fractures of the maxillary. The Surgeon General directed that all Confederate hospitals set aside a ward to deal with facial injuries, and that was uh, unique for its time. Uh, this is the uh, field kit that was available to Union uh, physicians, uh, but the trademark of the, the war was that of amputation. More limbs were chopped off during the Civil War than any other uh, any other time in the history of uh, American medicine. Three out of four operations were amputation. Of course, the big problem was once the knife had done the amputation, it was up to the germs. And in fact, it was, it was really expected that there would be this infection that followed the amputation. And it was whether, and very often, if you survived the surgery, then the question was whether you would survive the infection that ensued. Uh, this is the report of the Union. Again, the South records were lost. We don't know. 
but it gives you some idea of what was going on and what was true for one is probably true for the other. But you can see the number of amputations. This was the Confederate field kit. <laughs> you can see the difference. <clears throat> of course, it did the same job, but uh, it was very common practice for nurses, uh, surgeons on both sides to probe for bullets with unwashed fingers <clears throat> and wipe their soiled hands on their aprons. And of course, none of the bandages were sterile. Uh, instruments may be washed off, maybe not. Uh, and then pus was just part of the healing process. I think it's important that a lot of these men were moved some uh, in, into churches and larger buildings, but in most cases they were taken to stables. And of course, being in barns and stables, they were certainly exposed to, to tetanus. On April 24, 1862, knowing, anticipating the arrival of the Navy, U.S., the Union Navy, Confederates burned boats, cotton, warehouses, and materials along the docks in New Orleans. And when it fell to the Union forces May 1st, after the blockade, then everything changed. A third of the state was in Union hands. Trade and marketing was crippled. The slaves in this part of the state were freed, the first slaves to be freed uh, during the war. The first dealing with freed slaves and uh, came about in Louisiana. They had to, it had to be dealt with here. We, we had free uh, Negroes, but the slaves, you can see the number of them, the, for the whole state was some 331,000, and in New Orleans there were about 15,000. So most of them were rural, working on plantations. So the question was what was to happen with them, what were they to do? And so uh, these, this all had to be answered in Louisiana first. But uh, so in the, the entire country, there was some almost four million slaves at the time. Uh, they were emancipated. And they very often just wandered around, tried to join the Union forces. And even then, there's stories about them being uh, uh, not well managed handled by the Union Army because they were more involved in fighting than trying to to save these people. They tended to move to the cities. They had heard that the life in the city was good, so they ended up going to the city. But uh, that was no, no means to offer them shelter or food. And of course, they became prey to disease. It's interesting, they were not wanted in the North. Uh, it, they were not encouraged to go up there. It was only those who took it upon themselves to get there because they, there was no employment for them up there. And even at the end of the war, the soldiers who were returning for the Union uh, wanted the jobs. And health care was arranged for these people. And in fact, it became the first large-scale welfare legislation in American history. And again, that started in Louisiana. There was a Freeman's Hospital established in New Orleans However, this idea of furnishing welfare to people was not popular for either the North or the South, and uh, it was vetoed twice by President Andrew Johnson, who followed Lincoln, and actually was disbanded in 1872, leaving no one to care for the, the freed people working in the South. Now, getting into what our phys physicians uh, needed to be trained in Louisiana. In the rest of America, the Revolutionary War brought a loss of physicians because most of them were coming from England uh, to the Northeast or from Europe, where in, in Louisiana, they almost always came from, from Europe in training. But uh, there was a disconnect between America and Europe, and there were just not enough physicians available to uh, deal with the people, the influx of people into the country. And the birth rate uh, that also took place, uh, there was just not enough physicians to care for these people, uh, north or south. Uh, demands prompted uh, apprenticeships to learn under the uh, tutorship of a practicing physician, and schools sprung up everywhere. And it took very little preparation, only took money to pay for having a doctor to uh, give a lecture 
Uh, and so there were a lot of different schools all across America trying to turn out more physicians. And most professions, professors were a little better than their students, and most had no ex access to hospitals or dispensary. They were just practicing outpatient uh, medicine because the home was the hospital, and that's where you gave birth, and it's where you died. Uh, there were just not hospitals everywhere. Now, unique to Louisiana was that it was still connected to the, uh, the continent. Uh, the Creoles were sending their sons abroad and were studying in the best schools at the time in France. And uh, in most cases, they were feeling a physician was a professional, and in some cases, they were actually more academicians. In other words, they read medicine, uh, grounded in the classics. And uh, this was uh, more true for the, uh, the Americans. And of course, when they came into Louisiana, that ended up changing uh, how uh, physicians were, were actually trained. New Orleans was one of the largest towns to the west, uh, from the, the east, uh, and it had an extensive hospital system, both charity and that that was set up uh, first for the military and then taken over by some physicians. And it was a better place to study anatomy, it was cheaper, and there was a lot of population that kept the hospital full, and we discussed that in the last session. Uh, commercial and maritime, uh, it was a, a commercial and maritime town, and it shared a higher number of surgical cases that were being brought in and occurring. And there was definitely more pathology, and of course the epidemics proved that. One of the main way of training 19th century uh, physicians was uh, by apprenticeship. Uh, that is, with uh, having someone interested in medicine, aligning themselves with the local doctor. Sometimes they would travel to a community where uh, a notable physician was in practice, and the uh, apprentice would try to align himself with this. I think it's also notable that many English and American uh, Americans, uh, if they went abroad to study, did two things. They went across and studied theology, and at the same time they were studying theology and religion, they, quote, read medicine. Uh, because if they couldn't get a church back in America to pastor and to preach, uh, they could fall back on medicine. And in fact, getting a theology and religion degree was a, considered an art, and in some cases it was three or four years of study where medicine wasn't anything near that. So it was really, it wasn't considered uh, really an art as such. In Louisiana, the me medical college uh, or the University of Louisiana, which existed from 1847 to 1893, uh, uh, opened its doors and began training potential physicians in 1835. It was founded by Dr. Warren Stone, Dr. Thomas Hunt, and Dr. John Harrison none of whom were originally from Louisiana. They came from uh, back east. But they came to New Orleans and saw the importance of establishing a means of training physicians. And you can see they had some 402 students by 1860. It was not a four-year college. It was maybe one to two years at the most. But it was directly tied to a hospital. And by 1860, it was ranked as the fourth school in the country or a place to train. So it was well thought of back then. It became Tulane School of Medicine in 1884 and was the only one of others that were in Louisiana uh, over time. Until 1868, a candidate for a medical degree was, was examined by all professors on the same day. And again, this is after maybe one year at the most of training or attending lectures. And, and for others, it might be a year and a half, might be two, but it varied for everybody. The important thing was to take this one and a half hour oral exam in the presence of the professors where there was a pass rate that far exceeded any that failed. And it was the responsibility of every professor through the sale of tickets to his course uh, that he made his living and he had to collect his own fees. In other words, it wasn't collected by the medical school college, it was by the individual 
professors. And also of interest was these lectures were open to the public, and the, the media also usually attended these lectures, trying to pick up interesting topics that could be uh, shared with the readership of that particular paper. Also uh, starting in uh, New Orleans was the New Orleans School of Medicine, and it was founded by Dr. Fenner. It opened in 1856. It's notable to believe that this was actually started because so many of the young people uh, who went to the North to receive education prior to the war uh, were being indoctrinated, uh, indoctrinated against slavery and a lot of things the South stood for. And so having these men come back to Louisiana to either to practice or to be involved was really posing a problem to those in leadership. And so uh, this prompted the doctors practicing in New Orleans to, to offer another means of education for uh, uh, medical students other than uh, the, uh, the medical college alone. So they formed uh, this uh, college and initially it had uh, 10 faculty members and 76 students in the very first year. But because it wasn't immediately aligned with Charity Hospital, it really had to fight for what uh, to get in there. But I think it's important, it's the first school in America to inaugurate a systematic method of bedside teaching, assigning students to individual patients in rounds made by professors. We just took that in our time in training that that was how you learn. Well, it took place first in New Orleans. Also that came about in 1888, later date was the New Orleans Polyclinic, and this was founded by Dr. Matas and other surgeons. But it allowed for postgraduate training beyond just getting a medical school. And again, back in the 1800, medical school was not four years yet. So it allowed for, for physicians who wanted more training more education in medicine, particularly in surgery, to gain it by working in this clinic. And it raised entrance requirements and lengthened the course of study. And it offered an alternative to apprenticeship, which was still going on. And it lengthened the experience and practice of interest. It also tied to the training of nurses in 1880, uh, beginning in 1889. Uh, medical writing in Louisiana, notable that the very first that was really reported was 1817, and we spoke about this. This is right after the, uh, uh, during and after the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, this doctor, who was an um, uh, army surgeon who wrote the uh, medical tract and researches on the topography and diseases of Louisiana. In 1844, the New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journal was founded by Dr. Fenner, the doctor who had something, who had a lot to do with the formation of the New Orleans School of Medicine and Dr. Hester. And of course, important is that this eventually became the Journal of the Louisiana State Medical Society, which uh, we have today. Uh, there was an 1854, a New Orleans Medical News and Hospital Gazette, very popular across the nation and was really the leading uh, periodical of the South until the war began. Uh, subscriptions to both the New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journal and the New Orleans Medical News and Hospital because these went all across the country and was a source of educating, uh, continuing medical education and keeping doctors up to date. And so those who were of uh, intelligence and interest had these journals that they uh, were able to learn from and read from to keep up with the latest uh, things that were going in the treatment of what was being offered at the time to patients. Just want to tell you about some of the men and the few women who impacted medicine from Louisiana. Dr. Watkins in June of 1804 drafted the first medical licensure law. Didn't last very long, but he was the first. Dr. Luxenberg, who we talked about, because he didn't believe a lot in mercury, he believed in bleeding everybody, but uh, he tied off the carotid artery in the neck 
sometime in the mid 1830s also uh, took out a large parotid tumor involving ear, cheek, neck without anesthesia and because of this extensive procedure and the survival of the patient he won election to the Academy of Medicine in Paris uh, notable for a, a physician from the uh, from America uh, Dr. John Kerr operated it on Sam Houston after the Battle of uh, San Jacinto for a compound fracture of his right ankle. Interesting that he actually left Texas to come to see this particular doctor to help save his foot. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Richton uh, removed a 53-pound tumor from a male scrotum. Uh, Dr. Uh, Fergot, uh Frege studied the March temperature of yellow fever, became Frege's law in 1859, and also studied the fevers of malaria. Dr. Jus Touzre came to New Orleans in 1863 with the first clinical thermometer, and uh, du Dr. Dupaque uh, secured the first shipment of uh, diphtheria antitoxin in 1894. Dueling, of course, Louisiana was notorious for it, and physicians fought their share. I just want to share with you uh, one. There were several that involved physicians, and you'll hear about two of them in this presentation, and this is the first. In 1856, one of Dr. Samuel Chopin's students, he was a surgeon, was injured in a brawl. <laughs> uh, I guess interesting of medical students and taken to Charity Hospital. He asked for Dr. Chopin, his professor, to, who came and dressed the wound. However, Dr. Foster, the house surgeon, heard of this. He indignantly ordered the nurse to throw out Dr. Chopin's prescription and redress the wound. This resulted in a shotgun duel between the two, but both missed and the affair seemed settled. Then three years later, they quarreled over another patient that Chopin wanted to operate, and Dr. Foster refused to release the patient. The two men met at the front gates of charity, both well-armed. Dr. Foster got off the first shot, the bullet entering Chopin's neck, cutting the exter exterior jugular vein in two, causing Chopin's shot to go wild. Foster got off another shot, striking Chopin in his groin. Bleeding badly and his gun empty, Chopin drew his Bowie knife and staggered toward Foster. Fortunately, some of the medical students intervened and separated the two men. Foster was arrested since dueling was illegal within the New Orleans city limits. Chopin recovered, refused to press start charges, and Foster was released. The very first woman medical graduate to come to Louisiana was in 1857, Dr. Elizabeth Magnus Coyne. Uh, she was a graduate of Penn Medical College, uh, encountered little opposition. I don't know whether that may be an understatement, but primarily she was accepted because she was a wife of a physician. But she had to register as a midwife in order to practice. The media got caught up in this, and they gave their opinion against a doctorist taking care of a male patient and all the implications that might exist having a young woman having to examine and, and uh, uh, take history and examination of a male. Uh, the medical journals at the time uh, did not speak favorably of women being in medicine, but uh, when it came to the local medical society, uh, <clears throat> a New Orleans physician, Dr. Dowla, in 1860 felt really felt that women had no place in medicine, but advised the medical society not to be too outspoken. He wrote, quote, while the well wishes of women should discourage her from entering the perils of the medical profession, any coercive measures by the society on this person purpose will create public sympathy for her behalf, unquote. Midwives delivered more, uh, most babies in Louisiana uh, where first midwifery that came to the colonies in New Orleans were women who had been trained in French, in France, which had the very best of all the maternity schools 
this again fell apart as uh, Louisiana became part of the, uh, America. And uh, so by 18. 40, they were not so well trained, and the growing number of midwives were either strictly empirical or not existent. In other words, they just learned by doing. And there were frequent references in the New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journals during the 40s and 50s, that's 1840s and 50s, in cases in which midwives had killed laboring women by pulling out or tearing out the entire uterus. Dr. Francois Marie Prevost, MP, which was a uh, designation given to him because he had trained in Paris and had came and settled in Donaldsonville along the Golden Horn of where sugar was being produced. He performed the second cesarean section ever performed in America and between 1820 and 1825. He did the procedure twice on the same slave, no anesthesia, no uterine sutures, and saved the infant in both cases and the mother. We don't know what happened to her after that, but uh, this is just uh, a remarkable uh, accomplishment. This is an artist's conception of an incident that occurred before his fourth cesarean section in 1831. He reported he made agreement with uh, Madame Cadet Morus, owner of a 28-year-old slave, Caroline, uh, Belu, whereby Caroline's child, if it survived, was to be set free. And Prevost named the child, which was a girl, Cesarine. The mother made a good recovery and the op operation was elective and performed in good season. So from 1822 to 1861, some 15 cesarean sections were performed by physicians in Louisiana. I think overall in the South there were like 91 by the time of the Civil War. With 11, here in Louisiana, 11 mothers and eight infants saved. In every case, it was a slave. It wasn't done on a uh, white woman or a freed person until after the Civil War. It was only done on slaves because they were of value and, I, and, and they did what they could for them. Uh, another man of note here in Louisiana was Dr. Warren Stone. He was one of the founders of uh, the Medical College of the University of Louisiana, uh, which later became Tulane. He was a demonstrator of anatomy and a professor of surgeon. He was notable because of his strength and his ability at rapid, being very fast uh, in his maneuvers and willing to tackle anything. So he was, quote, the boldest and the most daring of Louisiana surgeons and uh, was a pioneer in early vascular surgery in 1836, first to, to ligate the external iliac artery in the groin, which had been caused by a gunshot wound. And he did, learned his surgery in pre-anesthesia days, and uh, again, was very quick in his actions. He is the very first Louisiana surgeon uh, to use ether in February of uh, 1847. As professor of surgery in the medical department of the University of Louisiana in February of 1847, using sulfuric ether, Dr. Stone operated on a man, a male of 50 years who had been injured by a circular saw, I believe in Mississippi. It had cut across his knee, and this had occurred three months earlier. It opened the joint. It had cut diagonally across the man's knee opening the joint and nearly cutting the limb off. The patient was unconscious when the ether was applied and his leg was off within three and a half minutes. That's how fast he was. So he was the first to use ether. Uh, Dr. Charles Caffaro was the second to use it. He was again a uh, surgeon in Donaldsonville and that was in April of 1847. And then Dr. Luxingbird, who we referred to earlier, a uh, notable surgeon in New Orleans in his day, was the first to use chloroform, as reported in the New Orleans Bee in January of 1848. Many surgeons of the day were stars because all of their work and their great cases were really uh, 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 reported by the media. Uh, 
and the public uh, came to know them as such. And, and even some of these procedures were open to people who would pay to come in and watch the work. A notable doctor in his time was Dr. Walter Brashear of St. Mary Parish. Uh, some of his fame preceded him to coming to this, this state. Uh, but he uh, was a, a born in Maryland, uh, then was moved with his family to Kentucky. He, quote, read medicine under a Dr. Ridgely in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and then went to Philadelphia to study under Dr. Benjamin Rush and Philip Singh Physics, who was a notable surgeon of his day in Philadelphia. He then went on to Paris to study came back, his uncle was a ship captain, I think out of, Merrill, out of Baltimore, and he went with him to China. But notable was that in 1806, confronted by a young man who had had an injured limb, he performed the first successful amputation of a leg at the hip joint on a young male slave in Kentucky. So notable that even today, as you go through, uh, I think it's uh, Bartville, Kentucky, there's a big bronze uh, sign that, that talks about Dr. Brashear and this procedure. To be able to be more successful, he decided that he needed to branch out and sugar was being produced in Louisiana and that's what he came to, to, uh, to see if he could uh, be successful at. So he actually purchased land on Bayou Tesh in St. Mary's Parish right at the Gulf. He brought slaves that he had uh, from Kentucky and his family with him, and he became very successful. Uh, here in Louisiana, he served in the U.S. Senate for many years and was a very influential Whig. Dr. Edmund Susong was an outstanding surgeon of his day. He was native to Louisiana uh, and was sent to Paris for his education. As it occurred, it was during uh, right before the opening of the war, and of course with the war starting, New Orleans falling, uh, he chose not to come back to this country and stayed to work at Charité in uh, Paris. When he came back after the Civil War, he became faculty of the medical college and eventually Tulane. He was responsible for establishing an outstanding medical, sorry for the misspell, museum. That meant he, he put things in jars uh, for people to, and physicians to study from. And, and that was the very first that to be done in Louisiana. He held dual chairs in both anatomy and surgery, and when he retired in 1907, uh, they split these departments. Louisiana State Medical Society was founded in 1878 mainly in response to very desperate times for medicine in Louisiana and, and prompted by many physicians that were uh, notable at the time. But Dr. Chalet, who was the dean of the medical school, uh, had written in the, earlier, in the previous year, quote, no civilized country can surpass Louisiana in the freedom from all practical legal restraint enjoyed by vendors of poisons and patent medicines, by superstitions and unskilled midwives, and medical quacks of every description, unquote. So it was things like this that prompted uh, the profession to sit down and become organized so that they had some impact upon the health care. And so it brought about a unity to the profession, uh, bringing together the profession in an organized manner and bring about necessary changes in public health and leadership, particularly before the state legislature on health and licensure issues. Uh, there are references and sources to what I've, I've said and to my slides and available here at the LSMS is a, uh, a list of these that can be furnished to you if you contact them. So I thank uh, the LSMS for supporting and hosting this series. Uh, and uh, all those who made it possible. And I thank you very much.